This is Metro Week. Our top story, evidence of ancient human civilization in the Tucson area. We'll visit an archeological site and find out what it tells us. Then our journalists roundtable analyzes the week's news. Welcome to Metro Week, I'm Andrea Kelly. In the process of preparing for a road project, Pima County discovered this archeological site. We're near sunset and I-10, and we're going to get a look at some ancient footprints and agricultural remnants. We start with an interview with Pima County archeologist, Ian Milliken. What road work preparations were happening out here that led to this discovery? So as part of any Pima County project that involves um, county land or funding from Pima County. In this case, this project is entirely uh, funded locally. And so as part of that due diligence process, as early as possible in the planning phase, um, the county sponsors a series of environmental studies. One of those studies happens to be a cultural resources study to assess whether the project has any potential of adversely affecting um, archeological sites or cultural resources. In this case, and this particular project, um, an archeological site was known to be in this area that was recorded probably over 20 years ago. And over the course of this past 20 years, other projects in the periphery of this one have identified that in fact this site does have subsurface deposits rather than just a surface disposition. So in this case we knew that coming into the project we would need a full archaeological mitigation in advance of the roadway project. So therefore before any roadway construction happens in order to assess the depth and stratified deposits of the cultural resource out here and also to get to the information that can be acquired from the excavations themselves. We put in a series of trenches all throughout the project area as defined by the Department of Transportation. Those trenches go in in systematic fashion, evenly spaced, we'll call it about 20 meters, and we look for not only a spatial distribution of features in plan view, but we also look at the temporal depth of the landform that we're on to see whether we have several periods of occupation um, stratified in those trenches. We then later move on to what's called phase two testing, and that's where we go in from the information that we've acquired in phase one, and we actually sample, excavate, and we look at high density areas um, in preparation to answer a series of research questions that we always pose prior to the investigation. How are these people living? What type of archeological features are we looking at? Are we looking at residences? Are we looking at extramural pits? Are we looking at thermal features? Are we looking at for ir uh, agricultural fields? Um, and so it, it's a structured excavation, and then once we do that sampling strategy, strategy, um, we really uh, get the answers to the questions rather than ne necessitating 100% excavation of the entire area. But you have done excavation. Uh, we're standing right in front of some, some agricultural fields that you excavated. So how did you actually get to this part where we can see things? Sure. So when, the, when we first came down in this larger area that I'm that standing behind, we knew that the top three feet of soil was actually imported fill that was brought in probably in the late 20th century as part of um, historic farming. Especially earlier farming was associated with the Sunset Dairy, which was located just to the north of me. In this case, we actually knew in the trench that we identified what was in profile of the trench, a slight parabola of um, a deposition that looked like a, a water channel. And that channel, by our geomorphology, and by the archaeologists, we needed to really differentiate natural channels versus cultural channels. The channel that I'm referring to are the three lateral channels that you can see in this um, field system. They have raised berms on both sides of them, and if you imagine you're looking at the parabola in a profile view, you can see that distinction. The very next thing you need to do in order to define whether it's cultural versus natural is actually to come down in plan view. So the entire area that you see behind me, we actually started from the elevated ground surface and stripped back and even layers coming down slowly on top of that deposit which we identified we knew the the amount of fill that was above it as we were coming down mechanically with the backhoe Dan Arnett who's a backhoe operator working for SWCA environmental consultants who is the prime archaeologist co uh, contractor for the county on this project Dan's been doing backhoe excavations for about 30 some years and what I always like to say what I can feel with the trowel in terms of different different uh, difference in compaction uh, Dan Arnett can feel with his backhoe. Wow, so he knows when he reaches an important exactly. different layer. So what he noticed is he was coming through these layers stratigraphically and he noticed that at the bottom of, the, of this kind of probably top two and a half feet to three feet of sediment, he realized that he was actually coming down on a very, very 
different soil. It was a soil that um, was primarily a silty sand, a lot, of, a lot of mica in it, and it was about six inches deep. And he noticed when he got out of his backhoe in scraping that, that it was very kind of fluffy. It almost just popped up naturally. So Dan uh, basically took a blower and he took a trowel and he started scraping out. And sure enough, he realized that there were these cast holes of mud, basically, that the, the sediment was blowing out of. And when he came down on the first cup, he started excavating with his trowel and he came to an end surface. And then he went the other way and he realized that it was a slightly raised and then it dipped back down again and dead ended into what became a toe socket. And sure enough, he had at that point the heel and the arch and the toes of the very first footprint out here. Wow, and so in, in the few months that you've been looking, how have you been able to figure out what those people were doing, what those footprints are part of? Sure, through all of the data that we've compiled, we, we've realized that we have a, a small window into a 2,500 to 3,000 year old agricultural community that was at minimum four individuals and one child, at maximum up to eight individuals and two children. Not only have we identified how they were working in the fields and how they were actually operating this field system and canal system, but we've also been able to decipher um, stature and gait of how these people are moving through the fields. We, re we found one set of tracks in which an, uh, an individual was carrying a very, very heavy load and dropped that load at a specific point and then their gait normalized and they started walking away. We have another example of two individuals that turn to talk to each other. We also have a, a set of dog prints which either can be possibly a coyote or a canine, that uh, domesticated canine. And in this case, um, we like to debate this in archaeology, but the, definitely domesticated dogs at this point in history. But in this case, watching the movement of the tracks and observing the movement of the tracks in relation to the people, I do believe it's probably a domesticated canine. Oh, wow. And you didn't know that a few months ago. No, we did not know that a few months ago. A few months ago, we said, wow, the research questions that we proposed, we never ever thought it would be possible to come on top of human footprints. You just never guessed that you would have that type of preservation. And in this case, we had come down on agricultural fields before and agricultural fields that of this temporal period. But we've ha actually, this is actually a little bit later than uh, the earliest known agricultural fields in the Tucson Basin, which predate this by about 1,000 to 1,500 years. Those were located just north at Ina and I-10, right under the Pima County Wastewater Treatment Center. But the other very interesting and unique feature about this system is that the waters that fed this system originated from the Rito as opposed to the Santa Cruz. Now what that means is, is that this is the first system where we're actually seeing use of a large scale agricultural system or originating with waters from the Rito, which is arguably a much more reliable water source than the Santa Cruz. Everything out here most likely is an agricultural field system, but in this case, we're opening up a small window and the amount of information we've uncovered from that small window is phenomenal. And so the canals that are in, that fed these fields from the Rito, they brought the, the irrigation, mm -hmm. but also a Rito flood is what enables us to see this today? Sure, yeah, so the, the very unique series of events that allowed for the preservation of the footprints is that most likely the episode that we're seeing out here, the episode in which their footprints were left in history, was a spring event. And we think that for a lot of different reasons. Among them, we look at the planting holes that are out here. And in excavating samples from those planting holes to assess the pollens, to assess macrobotanical samples, and, get, and try to attempt to get what they were actually growing out here, uh, most likely, our, basically our null hypothesis that it was, it was corn some derivative of corn. But we'd like to be proven wrong. We'd like to see a diversification of crops. We'd like to see a crop that we haven't seen before. So that's answers that we're looking for in the future when we run these samples. But out here, when we looked at those um, uh, planting pits, is that we noticed that there was kind of no modeled surface going down from the planting pit, which would represent a mature crop. So if this was a, an autumn event and you were dealing with a mature crop and a harvest, you most likely would have a little bit of a root bulb going down from those planting pits. In this case, the planting pits look pretty straightforward. They look like they were excavated. They look like they were probably planted and then the dirt filled back in. And then most likely what happened was is that you had, they flooded their fields initially and walked around in that wet surface. And we've got a lot of different um, depth of uh, footprints, so like real, squishy mud. real squishy mud, some drier mud and so forth. And then the next thing that happened is after they finished the work in their fields and they left this area, 
the next thing it would need to happen is in order to retain the definition that we're seeing 2,500 to 3,000 years later, we're seeing toe grooves, is that you need a drying event. You need that mud to cure. And it needed to cure enough so that the very next event that came in, which was a flood from the Rito, brought with it a very, very light, silty sand sediment in the waters that basically trickled in, filled in those prints, and capped them at a surface that's higher than the surface than when they came back than when they originally started. So when they came back um, to look at their system, they said, oh, it flooded. And it flooded, so they're working an arguably higher system. Meanwhile, those prints are preserved right underneath. And sure enough, the very same event that led to the preservation, that unique flooding event is what led to its excavation 3,000 years later. It's Dan observing that micro flood event that we're seeing, albeit about six inches at its deepest, uh, at its deepest point. You gave some public tours a few weeks ago, and you said one of the most common questions is what's going to happen. Tell our viewers the same thing. What happens next? We were able to work with the engineers to identify that this area, as we see it, is actually not going to be impacted by the roadway itself. There is a drainage structure that is associated with the roadway to help with drainage because of the road. And that drainage structure is, I kid you not, perfectly aligned right over the center canal. We actually have two stakes marked right here, one on top of the ramp right here, one on the other side. If you stand at one of those stakes and look at the other one, it is perfectly aligned by chance right over the central lateral canal. And we will have an irrigation ditch that goes right down to the top of that canal, but will not impact the surface of that canal. The county's gonna be covering this area up with a fine layer of sand. We're gonna be putting a protective fabric on top of it, and then all construction will occur above that surface, therefore protecting this area for perpetuity underneath the drainage structure. And what are your plans, future plans, for public education about what you've learned here? In this case, because we know we've done the tours, unfortunately, some people didn't get out to see them. And I would love to keep this open as long as possible and to delay construction, but unfortunately, construction needs to move forward. Fortunately, we live in an age of technology where we've done 3D imagery of this entire thing, where we can actually get to and replicate any of this area with a 3D printer at sub-millimeter accuracy. We can have exhibits online and also um, in any kind of medium out here, which I can go into in a second, but but online, we can have people literally take a photographic tour through the area and zoom into different footprints and be able to um, engage with it in kind of a three-dimensional model. The other thing that we're definitely going to be working on is in planning is once the roadway is complete, the roadway is going to have a multi-use pathway. And adjacent to that multi-use pathway, we are looking at creating an exhibit with a written description, a written plaque, probably several photographic exhibits, but as well as having one of those casts in the exhibit um, in a permanent surface that we don't need to worry about wind and rain. But the other thing is creating, recreating this surface in a more permanent surface on the existing ground, on the ground surface above the fields where the roadway is going to be and actually having people able to kind of walk on the exact same area just above the dirt presence that's underneath of it. And so in 20 years, someone takes a walk along the roadway and they can learn what you found here. Absolutely, absolutely. And one of the things is, is eventually the loop in its current orientation along the frontage road right here is going to be moving towards the Santa Cruz. We were thinking about, we really are interested in doing an exhibit along the loop, but we're going to wait until that move happens. And that way we can create one exhibit that doesn't need to be destroyed when this portion is destroyed. Mr. Milliken and his team also shared the details of their findings and the process they underwent to get to those. I was coming up over this berm here and I was going to drop down into this field and then I came across this had a bunch of that sand in it so I started cleaning that out and this all of a sudden this looked like a heel and then I came further up and then there was an instep of a right foot and then I started pulling the sand out of here, and then it dead-ended into this big toe. And then the, the rest of the toes were right there. And this was uh, a footprint that I've been looking for for 34 years in doing this. I'm, I, I, I figured there had to have been some footprints in the mud somewhere. So it was one of the most exciting things in my life to, to, to finally, finally find that. You know, and it was a little bit of crying and laughing and shaking a lot, and it was fun. It was great fun, but uh, 
So then after that, uh, I have started with, I took the blowers and started blowing the sand off and uncovered another footprint here and then realized that there's a heel print here and there's all of these multiple footprints that are all intrusive on each other in here. And then as we started, uh, Steve Ditchler and I, we started peeling this back and we found the, the berms, the dig outs, then we started finding the dimple pits where the plants were planted. We just kept finding more and more footprints and stuff. And then we realized that, you know, this was a mud plug that they put in, which is a uh, dirt that they used to dam up the berm to either open to let the water in or clog it, shut the water off. The way they watered the fields here was the flow was coming from the east to the west. The gradient is on a 45 degrees to the, feet, to the, the canals. We found that when we excavated this uh, out, that this mud plug, this right here was open. They took the mud from here, they put it there as a dam. They diverted the water into here to water this field. Once that field was full, they would open the opposite corner and drain the water back out of it. They just wanted to get enough water to, to fill all the dimple pits. And then once that was full, they would drain the water. So they, re, they, they used as, you know, the least amount of water for, for watering. And that would be watering this one. That would be opening it up to drain it. And this mud plug here, since it's got a lot of footprints in it, this one might have actually been draining into this field. The footprints are really deep in this field, so we know this one was really muddy at the time. Because the, the person that walked from here to there, he really sunk deep in that field. One of the farmers that we have came across, his footprints come from over there and where the, where the mud plug is open that it's called a weir and the weir is open, that's watering. And then he walked over to this area and did something. The mud plug over there is shut. And then he walked across here and then walked back that way and went back to where he came from. It's amazing that you can see this person walking around doing this work 3000 years ago. That's not a time machine, I don't know what it is. You know, I mean, this. It, 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 it makes your hair stand on end, you know, when you just think about the, the science that's here and uh, the ability to be able to see stuff that we haven't been able to see ever. Hi, I'm Lorraine Rivera. Tonight on Arizona Week, the number of children in state custody continues to rise, as does the turnover rate of caseworkers. The changes that are going to have to happen to the system aren't going to happen overnight. Now our journalist roundtable. Joining me in the studio today, Linda Valdez of the Arizona Republic, my colleague Zach Ziegler, and Patrick McNamara of the Arizona Daily Star. And Patrick, I'm going to start with you because you also went out to that archaeological site and saw it in person. And I just wanted to get your impressions of it. I mean, I obviously think it's really cool <laughs> because I'm doing a show yeah, on it, but what did you think? Well, it was incredible to see. You could, you could obviously tell that it was a field that people were using for farming, but what really brought it to life is the footprints. And you can, like uh, Ian Milliken described, you can track where the people were walking to. Uh, you could see these, these uh, toddler size footprints and you could just really get the uh, sense that these were actual people living there that had you know, lives like you could imagine and were part of a community. And you see these toddler prints following one of their parents probably into the field. And it was, it, it was really brought to life the fact that there have been settlements here and people living in this region for thousands of years. And, and one of the things, we, we aren't quite sure how well that translates on video, because having seen it in person, and then you see the video, like I know what I'm looking at, but um, yeah, it was incredible to see in person because you really can see those toe grooves and you can see the toddler, not just an oval, but toes and heels. Um, so Linda, I wanted to ask you just kind of the big picture of this. What, what can we or should we take from a site like this when we think about local politics and present day and all the things that are stressful in our lives right now? 
it should make us a little more respectful and, and, and maybe a little more humble about what we're doing here to realize that people were here 3,000 years ago, living their lives, walking around, and dealing with some of the same problems we're dealing with in terms of building canals for their water. I mean, it's, it, it's an experience that, if we think about it, I think will help us be a little bit more respectful of, of the, the, um, the land that we're living on and maybe put it in a little bit more context because we tend to think of everything we're doing in the short term as being really important. That puts a little bit more of an emphasis on sustainability and the importance of that. Doc? Uh, yeah, I've, I've really thought it was interesting to, to hear a bit about that and the whole history of, of everything that's gone on here. You know, it's something that as you grow up in Tucson, you hear a lot about the Hohokam who lived here 2,000 years ago, and this, I believe it would have been the Desert Archaic period, uh, which goes back even further than that. It's always very interesting when you get these little glimpses of what daily life was like back in that time. Yeah, and it's, it seems like, you know, we talk about pottery shards and other kinds of evidence of human existence, but actual footprints just really, really drives it home, I think, a little more. All right, I'm gonna to switch topics. Um, Zach, you've been covering this crowdfunding effort for businesses, and it's a new way for business financing. I wanna first have you explain what it is and, and why it's available. So the rule has been referred to by a lot of people as equity crowdfunding. Uh, basically what it is is companies, as opposed to in the past where they had to go through uh, people who were specifically investors, they these companies can now basically make an open call to the public, to anyone who lives in Arizona. The first company to go through this, uh, the rule came through about a year ago. First company now to try it is one of Tucson's microbreweries, 1055 Brewing Company. And they've basically put out a call. They want to move from their location in East Tucson uh, to downtown, where there's a thriving scene for these kind of things. Uh, they've put out a call to investors they are seeking uh, nearly $2 million. They're willing to put out 30% of their company to, to, uh, to get people to basically buy in. This isn't like Kickstarter or GoFundMe where maybe you're pre-buying a, a good or something or getting some special perk. You're actually investing and buying a stake in this company. But any layman can do it and it doesn't have to be a high dollar amount? Is that is that the case? Well, with Tucson residents, uh, or with Arizona residents is uh, one of the rules. You can't be from outside of the state. Uh, the other thing is uh, companies do set their own minimums for buy-ins. Uh, in this instance, it is $10,000. So it's, it's a pretty hefty amount. You are still definitely operating in the world of investors, but it's not so much like going through the venture capital world or the investment broker world. It's much more opened up. Have they been in it long enough to have some lessons learned that the next companies could benefit from? Uh, so far, they've said they've had quite a bit of good luck, actually. They are a little more than a month into it, I believe, and uh, I was told they are, are several hundred thousand dollars into their goal. They're looking pretty solid on what they're doing here. And they said, you know, it's it's been a bit of a it's it's been a bit of a challenge because not only are they going through this with the first time with their legal team that they are working with, the state is going through it for the first time. So so there's a little bit of hemming and hawing and working together to figure out how the process will actually go first go forward since this is the first instance of this being used. So simply how it gets done might be the lesson learned in a few months or a few years. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And having a, a good backbone and a good structure. Is, I'm just wondering, so if, if, if people invest in this, then they actually own part of the company? It's sort of like a mini stock market kind of thing? Yeah, basically it, it operates a lot like we see in the venture capital world where, uh, okay, uh, here's how much money I'm willing to invest in your company, uh, what percentage of the company am I buying? So they're pu almost putting up a third of the company. There are two owners at current, and they're going to create a third, basically a third entity that they're running their company with uh, in the form of their investors. Their investors will get to put someone in the company who helps make decisions on how things are run, and it will be equal third split. Do they have a minimum investment? 
uh, minimum was uh, $10,000, I believe. But each company could set that at, on the, whatever minimum they choose? Uh, I believe there was nothing that I saw in the state law that said anything about uh, what the minimum amount, you know, if someone's really looking to go small scale, they could be talking about five, ten dollars at a time. Wow. Interesting. That'll be interesting to see how it goes. I'm sure you'll continue following it and we'll ask you about it. <laughs> Linda, we can't get through a show without talking about politics. And so I wanted to visit one of the columns you wrote this week, uh, which was about the upcoming education funding election in May. We've talked about at this table, some of the complexities of it before. But you said that this is going to specifically or particularly be a dilemma for Democrats. Why do you think so? Well, I think it's a particular a dilemma for Democrats because Democrats tend to support education funding, but they don't support some of the other things that are, that are the tricky parts of this proposition. It would, well, for one thing, it takes money from the state land trust to pay back what's owed to the schools, doesn't pay them back all of it, pays them back 72% of what they were denied by the Republican legislature. And at the same time that we have a budget surplus that they could be used for that purpose. But what's really troubling, I think, to a lot of Democrats is the fact that it builds in a cap in the state constitution that says if education funding reaches 50 percent, they can start reducing education funding. 50 percent of the general 50 fund? 50 percent of the general budget, of the budget. Okay. And it right now is at 42 percent. We have a governor and a legislature that is interested in reducing the size of government. So you could, you could see a scenario where that might happen. And I think that's very troubling, especially in a growing state. There's also concerns about what this would mean to the state land trust itself. And there are concerns about whether um, the governor is just freeing up money for tax cuts, which essentially is what happened with the one cent sales tax back in, in, during the recession when, when Governor Brewer put that out. Voters voted for it, and then the legislature went and made huge corporate tax cuts that are still being phased in. Do you have any insight on how uh, a Democrat is going to be able to weigh those things and come to a conclusion? I've heard people on, on both sides. It, it's a very difficult decision because without this, the schools are unlikely to get anything. An, initi an initiative would be hard to run because the governor is already on record against that. The one in, in 2012 to extend the one cent sales tax went down under the weight of a lot of dark money. That likely would happen again. And the legislature is not going <laughs> to, the legislature is not going to provide any money for this. So it's kind of this or nothing. It's a really tough choice. All right, well, that's another issue that we're definitely going to keep following through the May election. And Patrick, in our last couple minutes, I just want to talk about an, a big story that you also had, which was um, the social media use among public officials. Specifically, you looked at Pima County officials and the Board of Supervisors and some of the departments. First of all, tell us briefly how, how that should work, public disclosure of social media. Sure. You know, if they're official accounts, if you will, you know, representing departments or that elected officials use to represent their office, not personal accounts or re-election accounts, for example, then they're considered public record like like any other public record, you know, the, the challenge is uh, they're not coordinated with a centralized server, for example, with, with uh, county government. So it's this third party online forum and archiving that information is, is a challenge, but they're technically considered public documents like anything else would be, uh, emails, for example, and they should be archived and maintained uh, according to the, what the state law says. So when you requested social media accounts information uh, from the county, different county officials, what did you find? What did you get? Well, you know, I didn't, I didn't get a lot of documents. I had a lot of folks saying, I mean, what I wanted to mostly see was uh, if, if there was uh, evidence of comments being deleted, and if so, were they maintained? Because even, even if comments are deleted or taken down from a Facebook posting, for example, uh, they have to be maintained. Uh, they can be legitimately taken down if they're uh, insulting or using coarse language, you know, any number of things, but uh, they have to be maintained. And I found that at least in one instance with uh, Supervisor Allie Miller, District 1, that what I was provided from her office versus what the county communications and administration had, had done through their own media monitoring didn't, didn't match up. So I brought it back to Supervisor Miller's office and said, I, you know, I have this sort of disconnect here, you know, these two different uh, records requests. Can you, you know, show me these comments that were deleted and posts that were taken down? And they were mostly non-responsive with that. All right.
right, we'll have to leave people to read the rest of your story if they want more details. That's all we have time for. Um, we're going to leave you today with images of Sentinel Peak, also known as a mountain, and that's where the iconic A marks its 100th year perched on the west side overlooking downtown Tucson. You can share your memories and tell us what it means to you on Twitter or Facebook. Just use the hashtag SentinelPeakA. Thanks for watching.